I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susi. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to another episode and a new season of Woo-hoo. the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And I'm JT Timmons. He's here too. What? Yeah, I know. I know, right? It's uh, crazy. It is. It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> welcome, y'all, to season six. It is uh, very exciting. We're going to kick off this beginning of the season with a deep dive into the Conjuring House. Because, as all of y'all know, we are going to be in that uh, <laughs> at the end of this month. <laughs> Three weeks. Yes, at 5 25 a.m. Is that correct? Uh, 505. 505 a.m. JT will be turning 30 years old in the con. Conjuring house. If he makes it. If he makes it. Possibly. I, I think I think Debrea, I think I think Debrea is gonna outlast us all. Well, yeah. 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 We've, we've set it up yeah. uh, in the perfect storytelling uh, exactly. context. She will be alone in the conjuring house. Right, exactly. We will, <laughs> we will we'll all be dead. Megan almost will make it. Megan well, you know, Megan it's, might leave. That's true. <laughs> <She'll be laughs> Megan will be in a hotel down the road going, the real, the real, ah, I wonder how they are drinking her hot coffee. And, the real final girl. <laughs> right. That's true. <laughs> She's like, those fools. <laughs> <Long sip. laughs> it's true. Um, so, yes, we will be in the Conjuring House at the end of this month on January 25th um, into the morning hours of January 26th. And fun little side note. We are bringing some friends along for this experience. Dun, 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 dun. Exciting. Exciting. We are bringing all of the Ghost Brothers with the us. The Ghost Brothers are joining yes. us. All three. It's going to be it's quite the time. It really <laughs> is. It's going to be so fun. There might be butts that are grabbed by demons. There might be, <laughs> yes. you know, screaming and banter. Although, if that happens, we'll know that it's probably more a them thing than it is right. a ghost thing. <laughs> oh, yeah. But yes, they uh, have agreed to join us on this wild journey that we are going into, into the tundra of Rhode Island in January. The tundra of Rhode Island. I'm horrified of this place in winter. It's um, people, people who live there are like, okay. okay. I'm from Florida, people. <laughs> no, no, My no, blood it's... is literally a dryer sheet. That is how thick my blood is. <laughs> <laughs> so, blood's a dryer sheet. Yeah. Um, so, we are going to be all going down to the Conjuring House. But before that, we have to deep dive into the history and the stories of the Conjuring House so that you know what to look for. And, yep, yep, yep. Um, but yes. Y'all before, are going to be fully prepared. You that will is, know that everything. Is what we are. Yes. That is what that is our goal is to get y'all. And we're taking all the pair junkies with us. Yes. yes. So, you know, uh pair junkies will be getting lives throughout and so they will be able to be on the watch out. Yes. Watch our backs and and fill us in on anything that they uh come up with, you know, because you can all research on your own mm-hmm. various factors because there are many more sources for this kind of uh for the information on the conjuring house we, exactly. we we're doing deep dives very close to the parent family we're going mm-hmm. straight to the source but there are other uh avenues and we, we can't explore them all exactly so um yeah do you do some research alongside us and all that there's literally hours upon hours and hours of reading that you can do yeah. on it uh trust me i know at this point um mm-hmm. but yeah if um If you are wanting to get an inside look of the investigation, you want to be able to watch alongside us while we're doing all the investigating and stuff. Now is the time to become a para-junkie. You have to be a para-junkie this month to be able to access that. Yes. Um, You can't get the live streams next month more than likely. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll probably edit something together. Yeah, we'll edit something (laughs) together. But if you want to see it live, you got to be... You gotta be with us. You gotta be with us. So, uh, and then at five oh five a.m., we are going to ask the ghost to blow out my candles. Yeah, that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna have a birthday cake. Yep. So, um, anyway, so before we get into that, we do want to um, do just a couple quick announcements. So, first off, we're gonna thank some new pair of junkies that joined us during the break. Um, so, we want to thank Ray, 
Soul88, Kelly, Josh, Angie L, Paige Harmon, Chaos Pokey. Oh, yeah. Christina and Taryn. Thank you guys so much for joining thank us. Thank y'all. Yay, welcome to the Parajunkie side. Are you Team Patrick or Team Jingles? Let us know. Who knows? Now they're both in the middle. Now you can actually see them, yeah. 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 Together. And so um, first, before we uh, talk about the nice little drawing behind us, um, if you are looking for new merch, we have Patrick and Jingles merch that is live on our website, hauntedcitypodcast.com. Uh, we had a artist draw everything for us, so it's all original artwork. It's very cool. And you can pick cool. what side you want to be on. Yes. I am partial to Jingles, of course. And so... Because she's evil. I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I'm in my villain era. That's... <laughs> <laughs> She apparently started at birth and will end a hundred years from now. Correct. And then afterwards. Yeah. So, um, but Jingles does have other fans as well, including Parajunkie L. Um, L actually drew and painted Jingles for us. This is called Jingle ta- Jingles Takes Five. Mm-hmm. Um, it's Jingles smoking a cigarette, which is just. Perfect. Amazing. It just is, perfect. With it's his amazing. flaming rat skeleton. <laughs> and I That's love that. Right. And um, yeah, that's my new favorite piece Some of, of our art. Some of are so talented. They're so creative. talented. It's just wild. Yeah, so Elle made this and sent it over to us. Um, so that does give the uh, invitation if anybody else wants to create any kind of like yeah. artwork of anything you can think of. Don't we have a squonk contest going on We somewhere? do. <laughs> I, have, I, have requ- <laughs> I have requested a squonk atten- uh, a squonkitation. A squonkitation. Yes. I believe, I believe Bring on Elle, the squonk. I believe Ella's on that all. My kid yes. just moved to squonk land. Yes. Uh, so my kid's up in Pennsylvania and I, I said – Keep an eye out for the squonk. Yeah, see, she is on squonk watch. <laughs> on squonk watch. As yeah. we speak. Squonk As watch. we speak. Squonk watch. And so, squonk watch. That's what we need. We need uh, big um, graphics. Squonk watch. Squonk, squonk watch. Shonk. Right, exactly. Debria, that's you know Debria. what to do. Shonk shonk. Shonk shonk. Shonk shonk. And so, um, yeah, if you're artistically inclined, send us some artwork if you're uh, feeling up to it. Um, and it doesn't have to be uh, Jingles or Batchik or Squawks. It could be anything that, uh, you know, y- you find interesting about the paranormal. We could use some some hat man pictures. Oh, we yeah. We could use, oh, you know, yeah. uh, give we'll us your best moth man. Yeah. Draw your sleep paralysis demon. <laughs> Draw your sleep paralysis demon. Um, yeah. Your favorite ghost, your favorite monster. Yeah. Yeah, eventually we'd like to, you know, fill this whole wall with artwork yeah. from people. Yeah, so, absolutely. Um, yeah, if you want to send us anything, um, we have our uh, mailbox linked on our website, and yes, it, it should be in our link tree as well. So, um, you should be able to find it there. Um, also, thank you to Monique, Parajunky Monique, for sending me these wonderful Mothman earrings for <laughs> the holidays. Um, I just got them today, and I'm very excited about them. It's moth- they're really cool. It's Mothman with botanicals. Yeah, they're <laughs> very, <laughs> very cool. And so, uh, thank you, Monique. That was very, very sweet of you. Um, so I had to wear them for the first episode, of course, and y'all know how I feel about Mothman. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. but... Yeah, L, L just uh, commented, Squonk is in the works. Oh, oh perfect. Excellent. Yes. I wonder what We're Squonk will be doing. We're looking forward to it. Yes. Squonkin'. You know, Squonkin'. 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 All right. Well, with that, we have quite the hefty episode to get into, y'all. Let's so into let's it. let's dive on in. It's going to be thick with how many C's? With uh, how many C's? Yeah. Probably 12. Whoa. It's a three. Well, there are at least three in the Perrin family. Yeah, there Perrin, are. Perrin, Kristen, and Cynthia. Well, yeah. let's go ahead and jump into it. So here's the thing. Um, the way we're going to break down this entity of its own um the conjuring house story this first episode is really going to be a breakdown into who the parent family is um and how did they get to the conjuring house because it's quite a series of unfortunate events if you will um before they ever get to this house um so the Perrin family was a family of seven, which included Roger and Carolyn Perrin and their five daughters, Andrea, Nancy, Christine, Cynthia, and April. Now, most of this information that I am giving to y'all comes from Andrea Perrin, who was the oldest daughter. Um, now, Andrea, I believe, is the only living child of the parent family I still that is correct um and so she has been very vocal throughout her life explaining you know um 
her experience with the house and things like that. So most of this information comes directly from her through her book, uh, which if you are looking to read it, it's called House of Light, House of Darkness, I believe. Um, and so correct me if I'm wrong, but you can look it up. Um, but yes, yeah, so it is a very fascinating book, uh, very thick. So I recommend, you know. It's in two volumes, isn't it? It, it basically is. Yeah. Um, I'm reading it in the online version. Oh, okay. So. I see. Um, but it is long, so you'll definitely want to, uh, sit down in multiple sessions with this one. Um, but it has wonderful reviews and I have thoroughly enjoyed reading it. So anyways, um, so diving into it now, Roger and Carolyn Perrin purchased their home in the suburbs in 1964. It was an adequate, modest Cape Cod style house with a generous backyard in Cumberland, Rhode Island. It was a deliberate choice based on the quality of the schools that their children would attend. So, you know, they se seem like normal mid, mid, you know, 60s family style um, people. They're like, we just want a nice, healthy education for our children here in Rhode Island. <laughs> See, is that your Rhode Island accent? Yes. <laughs> your, your, your New England <laughs> Well, let me tell you something. <laughs> I sure do like my children getting to schools. Nice, <laughs> nice schools up there. Uh, but yes, so in the summer of 1970 was when everything began to change um, for their uh, little neighborhood. The parents' idyllic and quiet little neighborhood would not be the same. And it all would begin with a little dog. Well, not so little. Little dog named Bathsheba. Um, so... Bathsheba was an African Basenji that the parent family had adopted in 1970. And according to Andrea, she was the sweetest, most magnificent creature that had ever, uh, they had ever known and a rare and exceptional specimen of a canine. Now, Carolyn told the family that she needed an unusual name since she was such an unusual breed. There you go. And oddly enough, Carolyn was the one that would produce the name Bathsheba, even though it was an unfamiliar name to her. Hmm. But they all liked it, so it kind of stuck. <laughs> well, there you go. Personally, I feel like that sounds like a demon. Yeah, no, presenting itself, uh, giving a name, uh, ah. and a name that you would you would call out and speak often. Uh, that's that's the kind of thing that you you really do have a sensation could be you know uh, a, a, an entity that is trying to insinuate itself into a family, right? Right. Exactly, and so. Um, kind of bizarre and makes you wonder if this entity hadn't been lurking before the conjuring house. <laughs> right so anyways but yes andrea per that position? it's perfect awesome so particularly andrea fell uh in love with the dog very quickly and she created a special bond with this dog now andrea one afternoon would ask her mom if she could take bathsheba for a walk even though she was only 10 years old now, mind y'all, it's the 60s. And so, you know, uh, well, actually, it's the 70s at this point. So uh, in 1970, people did not care if their children were walking alone in places by themselves. So, of course. Yep. Um, so, of course, Carolyn had no issues with this. But when all the siblings heard that Andrea was taking the dog for a walk, they all decided to join. So it was a family outing of children, at least. Um, so they were all walking up Mohawk Street, which is where they lived, and um, they were heading towards Diamond Hill, and that was a road that was very filled with cars. Now, there was one particular car that was filled with teenage children that roared by. According to Andrea, Bathsheba was an obedient dog, but the tassels, this is a direct quote from Andrea, the tassels must have caught her eye and in an instant she yanked the leash out of Andrea's hands and bolted across the road after the car. Which, I mean, if you have a dog of prey drive, you know, that that's very normal. Um, so Andrea, being a 10-year-old, is panicking and screamed trying to call the dog back. But that was the mistake. So Bathsheba had been safely standing on the sidewalk at the other side of the road and immediately followed the command. And Bathsheba was hit by an elderly couple. Hmm. And Andrea's direct quote of the incident was, her leash became wrapped around the wheel well and the damage was so extensive that there was no saving her. So the responding police officer sent the girls home and he had to finish the deed. Ooh. And so after the death of Bathsheba, the entire family was very grief stricken, but particularly Andrea, since she considered herself responsible for the dog dying in pain. Mm. 
um, she spent multiple pages just explaining how upset she was. Right. Um, she said that she stopped playing outside. She barely interacted with her siblings. And Carolyn hoped that time would eventually, you know, heal her. But the first few weeks of July would be kind of the last nail in the coffin for Andrea and the Perrin family in this home in Cumberland. So their last summer in the house. Now, here's the thing about their neighborhood. At this time, there are a lot of young boys in their neighborhood. And that particular summer, they created what Andrea referred to as a pack. She referred them as a pack of wolves uh, because they were unhinged. And so um, she described them as individuals that all seemed to be unacceptable, but as a group, they became the personification of what is ugly and mean-spirited in society. It's a bold statement. Right. It It kind of has that Stephen King notion of of New England, you know, of Maine, where, where, where groups would get together and just become like, the, the worst, the worst bullies, it, you know, the, the bully group, the it's bully groups. And, and, and you spent a lot of time being like, oh, what was happening in Stephen King's youth that that, yeah. that he would encounter just roving bands of bullies <laughs> that, you know, might cut your eyes out or, you know, do it's something true. terrible. Well, if it was anything like Andrea's neighborhood, um, I understand where well, he's coming from. And that's from. just it. It's like, oh, you know, uh, these stories come from somewhere. There's a reason why people have these memories of this brand of, of, of bullying. Exactly. And so uh, the parent girls were familiar with some of them, particularly the boys that lived next door. Now, some of the things that the boys would do were just like petty theft and minor property damages. But then they started to become concerning with rumors of weapons and sexual assault. Oof. Wow. One of the mothers in the neighborhood told Carolyn, and this is a quote from the book, There was an attempted sexual assault on a young girl who had been gagged and bound to playground equipment at their elementary school. So if that tells you anything you need Mm. to know about these heathens, yeah, it's a lot. This was like budding serial killers in this neighborhood. Sure. Um, Holy crap. So this type of behavior is important to remember. Now, so the parent family was planning a uh, on going on vacation. Now the six girls, so the five children and Carolyn, were very excited to spend time with Roger, because Roger at this time was a traveling salesman. So he was often gone for work, and Carolyn had arranged for her mother-in-law to house sit and watch the rest of their pets, which included four cats, two Siamese, and two strays. Now. The, pa- uh, the parent family returned from their vacation and everyone was feeling recharged and Andrea was finally smiling again. Uh, they had a lovely time, but when they pulled into the driveway, Roger immediately noticed that the door to the sun porch was wide open. He assumed that when his mother last left that she had forgotten to close or lock the door. Then Carolyn saw something limp on the picnic table. Mm. Oh boy. Mm-mm. Before Carolyn could stop her, Andrea was already heading to go greet her cat, Scrunch, which was one of the stray cats. Now, when Andrea received no response from calling the cat's name, she looked and fell to her knees. Her cat had been brutally murdered. Her skull had been crushed and every bone in her body had been shattered. Roger then went into the house and found that it had been ransacked There was food poured all over the floors. There was furniture that was overturned, mirrors shattered. The freezer full of food was open and covered in motor oil, and all the cats were missing. So So much for nine lives. That's not nice. These poor cats are being beaten to death, and here you are making jokes about it. Well, I think it went through all nine lives. I mean, if every bone was broken. It's true. But so here's the thing. Roger calls his mom and finds out that she only had left a few hours before. Oh, no. So when she left, the two Siamese were inside and the two strays were outside um, playing. And she left him out there because the weather was fine and the family was going to be home soon. So Roger then realized uh, when he went into the basement that the freezer with all of their meat had been destroyed beyond repair and nothing could be salvaged. Good Lord. So one of the strays had been found, but definitely had been brutalized. So that's Juliet. Now, Juliet uh, will continue living with the parent family all the way into the Conjuring house. And she's a big 
part of the story as well. So Juliet's fine. She's just been roughed up a little bit, but she escaped from the boys. But the Siameses were gone. Um, now, within a few days, a guilty young boy had come over and told Carolyn what had happened and who did it. Apparently, it was a 12-year-old boy that lived next door. He had schemed and initiated the break-in with his friends, and once they finished destroying the house, they held Scrunch down and beat her to death with a baseball bat. Serial killers. Mm -hmm. That's a serial killer, if I've ever seen one. Those boys. But, you know, it's interesting because it does sort of, if you wanted to take a supernatural look at this, this is a level of evil and malevolence that is so palpable. Right. Right. And to start with even Bathsheba's death, one of the things that, um, and, you know, just thinking out loud, when you have a dark spirit or a dark entity around you, they thrive on negative, sorrowful, grieving pain, you know, uh, and if they can cause it or if they can be witness to it, they will. It's a good um, point. So, you know, pets are, are oftentimes the, um, uh, the target of malevolent forces because we care for them. We love them so much. And when they die, our hearts break. And when they, and when that happens, nothing delights a demon more than our suffering. When you think of the level of pure, intense, uh, grief and, and maliciousness in this act, it does seem almost supernatural. <laughs> it almost right. seems like this family was already carrying with it some kind of curse, some kind of of darkness. Um, and it could have it could have been some entity that attached itself at some unknown time, right? You know, close to this, you know, revolving around this. Um, but I find that very interesting because this is what they brought to the Conjuring House. <laughs> And it's bizarre too because they lived in such a. No. Oh, it's yeah! I was just like, <laughs> for those of you who can't hear, there's a dog barking in the distance, and it's like, oh no, Bathsheba! Oh, no. They cannot hear. <laughs> no, he's Bathsheba! You literally, he's screaming because Bathsheba is um, is dead, is no more. Um, yeah, it's it's very interesting um, because it seemed like their neighborhood just did a full 180. When, right. You know, you know, I mean, and that's just it. You know, it's like when you think about how closely these events happened, how how intense they were, um, almost, you know, and it's it's funny because uh, we had brought Stephen King up earlier, but you have that, um, the dairy sensation of, of, mm, of yeah. it where there's something just turning people, you know, just making people crazy in a lot of ways. Uh, that's a fascinating aspect of it. I'm not saying that these weren't degenerate kids and that they sure. that, that we're not dealing with, you know, a societal uh, failing and and probably um, given the uh, the the post um, uh, World War II into the Vietnam War era of kind of societal constraints and restraints could easily develop and create this kind of behavior because you're it's more like um uh, Lord of the Flies, really. Mm. You know, you, you get somebody, uh, one bad egg to kind of get everybody into that fervor. But still, this is a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a and lot. Especially because it was only like a couple weeks apart, too. Right, a couple of weeks apart. The level of destruction, too, when you think of, you know, a group of 12-year-olds who destroy a freezer, you know, to make it an unsalvageable, to to go through this much destruction uh, on a whim and in a short amount of time, mm -hmm. in less than two hours, you know, in a less than a few hours, to to plan it, hatch it, carry it out, and then disappear. Right. And wow. beat the snot out of a cat. Well, so I mean, it's yeah. It's just you know, weird. It's just weird. And because that also means that uh, the complicit parties, you know, uh, it, requ it required everyone to be on board. Right. So even this kid who came forward guilty must have – it must have been weighing on him. But at the time, he was a part of it. You know, so these are these are the kinds of things that come up in my mind is when you – when we talk about demons, we oftentimes in our minds are imagining like, you know, some biblical reference, some Christian, pseudo-Christian idea. But the truth of the matter is – 
dark and negative energies create contaminated thought. They, 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 they color our dispositions. And, um, there was a long period of time when people who were like, you know, uh, even when you got an upset stomach, mm. it'd be like, oh, the spirits are off kilter. You know, you're, you're, you're experiencing a spiritual shift. So if you're having dark thoughts and doing dark acts, there's the, d the devil on your shoulder, you know, right. the, the, this notion, but it's, it feels like something, some dark curtain just right. kind of, you know, closed on the Perrin family, even before the conjuring house. When it feels like too. So what I find weird too is with Bathsheba, how Carolyn was the one who came up with it. Now I know right. you mentioned there was like a TV show in the sixties. And where I could be wrong about this. Um, I was mentioning earlier that it seemed to me that there was, it kind of looked like a little bijou dog, a little white dog. And I think it was called little Bathsheba, but I might be wrong. Um, and I can't remember if it was a movie reference or a, a, a t television reference. Um, but I, I seem to vaguely recall that Bathsheba being the name of a dog was, 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 was in there. Um, but I'm pulling on a memory that, that is very tenuous. <laughs> sure. I, I, I can't, I can't promise that I'm, I'm accurate there. But the weird thing is, is but still the youngest child coming yeah. up with a very, complex, you know, uh, mm -hmm. sort of biblically, uh, <laughs> well, and it's centric name. It, exactly. <laughs> it's not a common name. And no, it's, it's also weird that a woman who lived on the property that they eventually would get to is, was named, was also that. named that. Yes. And it's just, there's too many correlations to this where it doesn't feel like, because there are plenty of entities that will implant something into your mind. Thank you, Ajay. Right. That will implant something into the, your mind and not uh, and make it seem like it's your own thoughts. Oh, absolutely. But it's just dropping little seeds. Because you'll see throughout the story of their experience of getting to this house and eventually being in this house, everything just falls into place so perfectly for sure. them. Else, uh, Elle said, I want to know what happened to the boys uh, slash where they are now. And that I literally said that when you were telling me about so, this. So here's the tea, y'all. <laughs> we do another episode. Where are those evil boys? Now? Where, where are, are the are evil now? boys? Uh, so, Dead. so here's the tea. We'll, we'll talk more about this. Oh, actually, it's literally coming up right now. Um, so Carolyn called the police, but they did nothing. <laughs> they literally did nothing about these boys ransacking their house. And boys beating, will be boys. You know. <laughs> You know, <laughs> they love beating their the crap wild the oats. <laughs> <laughs> they love muttering stray cats on a whim. But anyway, so Carolyn went to the home of the boy uh, against the advice of the police. They said, don't get involved, Carolyn. And she's like, I'm going to go confront her mother or his mother. And so she picked a fight with his mother. Um, now, the terse conversation deteriorated, in a, a der, a deteriorated into an argument and an accusation as uh, the responsible party, which was the young boy, he started coming out of his bedroom. Both of his arms had been visibly scarred from scratches and evidence of a cat fighting for her life. Uh, his mother instantly ordered him back into his room, so she must have known oh, yeah. that her how, kid how was bad not? news. Absolutely. But um, no, this is what Carolyn or not Carolyn said. Uh, this is what Andrea says, but she says that the mother wedged her bulbous body between the door frame to block the view. But Carolyn was convinced of his guilt. So there was as much metaphorical blood on his hands as residual scars on his serrated arms. Now, the next day, Carolyn and Roger went to the Cumberland Police Department there to file charges against the juvenile delinquent and assault um, dressed uh, for assault dressed as animal cruelty. Right. The police still did nothing. <laughs> so um, now because of these two dramatic events, it kind of um, created a change in Andrea. As and, it would. <laughs> yeah. Well, so she um, she stated in the book uh, that she was no longer a demure little girl, but instead someone who was very angry and vengeful and suddenly became as evil as those who committed a heinous crime. Again, Bizarre. calling upon the notion of the dark energy. Dark energy breeds dark energy. Contamination is contamination. If the if the goal of a, of, of a dark entity is 
And because people think about, you know, what is what is the ultimate goal of a demon yeah. against a person? Right. And, and, and it's like, oh, it's temptation. Oh, it's temptation. It's corruption. Mm. Corruption is the um, is the goal. You take some an innocent child and turn them into a hateful, hurtful, vengeful thing. Uh, that is that is a, a a a perfect summation of an of an end goal for the for for the dark energy, um, and it may have actually already been spreading throughout Cumberland at that point. You know, it might have been an epidemic of sorts um, to include uh, the killing of the dog, to include the death of the the cats, because what those do is they 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 create the avenues of anger. And hate, and 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 of course, the desire for vengeance. And people don't understand that vengeance, when it's in your heart, doesn't stop at the person who wronged you. Vengeance is a poison that poisons everything around you. Nothing is safe from a vengeful soul, um, because people were like, "Oh, well, you know, you you want justice." It's like, sure, justice, but justice and vengeance don't. Are doesn't not the same thing. Yeah, you know, uh, justice oftentimes doesn't assuage that vengeful feeling. Sometimes when people go and and they are, you know, uh, handled through justice, that vengeful anger is still there, and you still want retribution of some type. And sometimes you'll take it from people who didn't do a thing to you. <laughs> That's true. Now, here's the thing: Carolyn told the girls who had done it, and that was a big mistake. She told the girls that she wanted them to have nothing to do with those boys. So, like, Carolyn's thought process was, like, stay away from yeah, them. Yeah, be safe. Yeah. Andrea's thought process was, great, now I have a target. <laughs> um, so, Andrea blatantly defied her mother's orders and devising a plan of her own when she knew sh who was responsible. She knew that she couldn't get all of them, but she knew that she could get the leader of the, of the pack. So she got her friends to help and swore them to secrecy, and they would use the telephone to track the whereabouts of her intended victim. <laughs> How I, I, she didn't go any further into details, so, but <laughs> mind you, this being 1970s, my guess is that means people looking out their windows saw him called on the phone and said he's going yeah. down this street. Called and said, "I see him. He's going down this street." These kids yeah, should because have been the, the, it's not. They, they didn't have GPS back right. then. You know, they, were, they, they didn't like low jack the boy. Yeah. Um, they, it was, you know, I, I'm like, yeah, using the telephone to track him, they, they probably created a telephone chain. Right. Also, I would like to say this is the plot of a Stephen King story. <laughs> Again, because you have a group of, of, of good kids banding together yeah. to, you know, uh, target the bully kid in, you know, in response to horrible activity and so here's the thing um well it took them three days to carry out her plan and as she stalked him throughout the neighborhood knowing the moment opportunity presented she would confront the criminal causing him to suffer as much as her cat did did she have a bat <laughs> well she didn't have a bat necessarily but she didn't have nine lives she had nine innings <laughs> She didn't take a bat to him. She yeah. took a fist. Don't Ooh. worry. So when she located him near the corner of Mohawk Street in Diamond Hill Road, unaccompanied by his bodyguard, as she referred to it, sure. uh, his brother, she pounced on him. And though both of them were roughly the same age and size, he was no match for her intensity in the revenge-driven assault. Absolutely. <laughs> And now, now we 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 can pull a, a full Star Wars uh, connotation, which is um, giving over to the dark side. Yes, uh, there is an, a, a never ending a well of of strength that you can draw from when you give in to that hate and that anger and that rage. Because if the other person doesn't p possess it, they do not have a defense. What they have is just the you know uh, j just being a target. This is you know one of those things when you when you hear about it all the time you know a street fighter can't beat up a black belt because of intent because there might be more at stake for that person more going on so yeah this and again 
as we have been kind of setting up is this idea of if there's a darkness there, it's feeding on all of it. Oh, it's feeding. Yeah, it's feeding. It is feeding, especially in this incident. Um, now, not once in Andrea's life had she had ever displayed any type of violent behavior until this incident. Mm-hmm. Um, yet there was, there she was on the side of the road beating this culprit bloody. Um, adrenaline coupled with pure unadulterated hatred it was very dangerous, and her victim would soon learn. She broke his nose, punching him repeatedly, and once his eyes sealed shut, she throttled his scrawny <laughs> neck, is what she said. Uh, she scr- throttled his scrawny neck, muffling his pleas for help, then took aim at every vulnerable part of his body, rib, um, some uh, rib groin, groin. all yeah. the all the spots, and so after several minutes of relentless and exhaustible brutality, the witness to this vicious attack came to his rescue, pulling the girl from him. So, the police got called, um, and the officer that responded was sympathetic, but was forced to file a police report. Did they not file a? Re- they went, we, we, right, Gur. Gur <laughs> is right because you beat the snot out of a child, but if he kills a cat and breaks every bone in its body and crushes its skull, man, boys, and does thousands of dollars of, of damage to a home, right? Uh, destroys you know property. Yeah. So, but they're like boys. Boys, boys will be boys, but girls shouldn't beat up. Yeah. No, unacceptable. (laughs) And so Roger handled the situation. They had to take this to court, mind you. Um, But whatever he said in the courtroom was sufficient to fully explain and likewise excuse her behavior. And though the charges were dropped, much animosity remained. And so um, this is when Carolyn started bringing up to Roger the possibility of relocation. She did not like her children being in such a negative and hostile environment. And so she then insisted that her children be raised in nature instead of being around budding criminals. Fascinating. <laughs> she wanted to get a place in the country. Sure. Uh, so Roger wanted to fill, fulfill this for his wife, but he knew that they could not financially do this at the moment. They hardly had any equity in their current house. And according to Andrea, Roger announced his plan to leave on business for several days. And he announced this like right after uh, Carolyn was like, uh, I want to move. He's like, well, uh, goodbye, honey. (laughs) So long. (laughs) So long. Which uh, effectively abandoned his spouse to deal with the dilemma, which would emerge a uh, theme for the couple. Right. I was about to say, I I feel like this is. Uh, what we hear time and time again in The Conjuring House. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Roger, he has a habit of just when the times get hard, he's like, so long. <laughs> um, but anyways, so long. Um, she says that the man had no choice. He had clients waiting, uh, appointments pending, but an actual convergence began Now, this is what Andrea says. She believes that an actual convergence began as a universal plan. It began spinning in perpetual motion, staring at the cosmos. Change was inevitable. The only constant there was was no predicting what was to come. So early the next morning, um, the day Roger was planning to leave, Carolyn and Roger were in the kitchen having coffee when they suddenly heard an explosion through their front yard. It sounded like a cannon shot. Andrea says it echoed throughout the the community. They both were alarmed, so they raced outside. And Carolyn, mind you, had created this rock garden near the entrance of their driveway soon after they purchased their home. And um, friends would joke and tease her about it, saying that it resembled a tombstone, (laughs) except it didn't have a name inscribed into it. And they were right about it accidentally. So... (laughs) When Carolyn and Roger got outside, they realized the man residing below them climbed into his truck that morning. He cranked the engine and had a massive heart attack and died behind the wheel. What? His lifeless foot collapsed onto the gas pedal of the truck and raced up the narrow lane, stopping only when it lodged upon a massive stone and its wheels were spinning. So Roger scrambles to his aid because there's a dead man in a truck on their property. Right. Um, And while Carolyn called for help, Mr. Curtis, uh, who was the man in the truck, was already deceased. There was nothing. Um, Now, 
Roger could have done. Uh, Roger could have done. Um, some, there's nothing he could have yeah, done. Yeah, there's really <laughs> nothing he could do. He couldn't revive him. No. Um, so as the neighbors poured into the road, the mother next door shouted vile remarks towards Carolyn about the graveyard on her lawn. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Strangely haunting, actually. <laughs> yeah. Um, they left with the body. Um, oh, well, they left the body there. And then Carolyn began breaking down. She was spilling tears and uh, was shaking. Roger had to leave, though, because he was literally about to head out on his work trip. Um, but she wanted him to cancel the trip. The sudden death upset him as much as it had his wife, and they had exchanged a few tense words before he departed, and stress was taking its measure on the man and the woman. Carolyn was trying to suppress her grief, but she was trembling when she was preparing a cake for the Curtis family, and she was planning to bring it over to their house in the afternoon, and she was promptly rejected and dismissed at the door, returning, um, and then she returned home. She was still carrying the cake she baked, and it was the worst of the summer heat. And mind you, you know, baking a cake in summer is brutal in itself, but she tried. Um, Carolyn knew it was time to go. And later, she confided in her friend Kathy, and she explained that Mrs. Curtis actually blamed her for the tragic death of her husband. And the woman blatantly accused Carolyn of being a witch. That was the last straw for Carolyn. Interesting. Wow. Yeah, right. There's a lot of interesting uh, uh, parallels that are that are that are cropping up. That um, that if you are sensitive at all, the echoes of which you would probably sense. You know, if you knew what was happening to them, uh, you would be like, "Oh, I I I, I can see." where somebody would immediately draw upon witch and mm -hmm. immediately draw upon bodies in the yard and immediately draw upon, right. you know, they pulled the name Bathsheba out of a hat. You know, it's like these are uh, fascinating uh, precursor to the events of The Conjuring House. It is. It is fascinating. Um, now, Roger got home eventually and Carolyn sat him down and explained what had happened while he was gone and expressed very hurtful sentiments um, about the death of their neighbor and legitimate concerns that she had for the safety of their children. His wife begged him to reconsider selling the house and leave its whole community behind, recounting all the stories of unfortunate events that became the basis of her conclusion. He agreed these were serious problems, but he reminded her that they were in no position financially to make a move. Certainly not one that was sudden, especially because Carolyn was fixated on getting the girls in, to a place in the country, which would eventually... Um, now, they eventually went to bed with a mutual understanding that it would take some time to transform the stream of uh, this you know, dream into a reality. So especially because there's no obvious or immediate remedy available. Now here's the thing. It wouldn't take <laughs> dun, dun, dun. It, dun, dun, dun. it would not take Carolyn long to find the right place. And or it found her. So I think they were always destined to have yes, this house. They're obviously on a path. Yeah. You know, uh, it, it, that's that's what's what's so intriguing about mm -hmm. all of this precursor stuff. You know, um those of us who are familiar with, with the actual events of the conjuring house, seeing all of these, yeah, it's, 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 it's almost like a roadmap. It is. You know? And that's why I think Andrea describes it as like this cosmic right. unfolding, you know, sort of thing. Um, because she's like, there's just too much that had to happen for this to be an accident. Absolutely. Um, so, there is a belief, if this was something that Andrea said, there is a belief that sometimes you can speak things into existence, and that might have been the case for Carolyn. Sure. While waiting outside the doors of Mount St. Charles Academy, Carolyn suddenly remembered that she had neglected to bring something to read. Um, she was waiting for Andrea to get out of her music lesson, basically. Um, now, she rarely... T would take Andrea to music lessons. The child usually traveled with her friend who also studied flute. Um, and it was uh, only an hour away, but in the heat of June in, and in Woonsocket, it was becoming extremely boring. So 
Carolyn found a shadier spot and she noticed there was a newsstand in front of the corner market there. So Carolyn purchased a copy of the wound socket call. Um, so she flipped through it a little bit and then she uh, crossed the road to meet her daughter as she popped out from one of the massive ornately carved wooden doors. <laughs> When they arrived home, the newspaper was temporarily discarded and tossed onto the corner of the kitchen counter. And after Carolyn made dinner, she revisited the newspaper later that evening after the kids had gone to bed and she was drinking her cup of coffee. She thought to herself, there's no harm in looking in the land and farms for sale column of the Woonsocket Call. Now, the Woonsocket Call was a comprehensive newspaper covering all of the northern Rhode Island uh, area, including rural or remote areas of the state, which is just bizarre in itself that she happened to be in a town yeah. that would have just these desolate areas right. in their newspaper. But regardless... And how she just happened to forget something to read. <laughs> but anyways, as she was looking through the page, her eyes caught an ad that said nine room colonial farmhouse with barn, 200 plus acres, Harrisville, $75,000. It was well past 9 p.m. And also this is 1970. So I know today's mindset, like $75,000 for a massive house and a ton of land sounds like, wow, that's a steal. That's a lot of money for back then for a property. Sure. You know, well, although 200 plus acres, <laughs> right? It's still a deal, but you know, regardless, um, it was well past 9 PM when she, uh, would spy the advertisement and the hour Carolyn <laughs> in during that hour, Carolyn called the realtor even though it was past 9 p.m., and made an appointment to view the property. The following day, um, so she went to bed that night and then laid there alone in the darkness, unable to sleep, disturbed by the persistent nagging regret of having made the call at all. Mm -hmm. What was the point? Roger had been very clear on the topic, and there is no extra money, no hope of moving anytime soon. The next morning, Carolyn called her closest friend, Kathy, and she was there within the hour while they were drinking their coffee in the kitchen. Uh, and then they were drinking their coffee in the kitchen. But the women whispered their conversations as the girls kind of mulled around. And uh, neither of them wanted to arouse any suspicion regarding it and um, about this sudden excursion. So Kathy encouraged Carolyn to go and have a good time house hunting. And um, it was just, you know, pure folly. Right. Which would call, um, it was basically, uh, it would be just some well-deserved hours away from the house, you know, cause she's, you know, pretty much always with these children right. and Roger is not. So sure. she's like, have fun. I'll, uh, I'll stay with the girls. So Carolyn would w meet with Mrs. Herzog, the listing agent, and they would meet in Harmony, Rhode Island. So Mrs. Herzog was apparently very kind, very generous with her time, and invited Carolyn into her car. They drove many miles of winding country roads, dodging neglected potholes along the picturesque um, roads and entering the village of Harrisville from the south. The realtor did a great job pointing out various landmarks like schools, libraries, theaters, town halls, churches, all of it. This was exactly what Carolyn had in her mind. As they rounded the corner onto the property, Carolyn first saw the barn and then three enormous evergreen trees lining the front yard at the farmhouse. Set back, it, consider it was considerably a far distance from the road as they pulled into the driveway and Mr. Kenyon emerged from the house, waiting patiently on the porch to greet his guests. He And he was also an elderly man, just for your own picturing in your mind <laughs> of whatever you want to picture this man as. Uh, Mr. Kenyon... Knew little about the earliest history of the house or its inhabitants, but he did and was absolutely enthralled by the property. She claimed that this was the place her of her elusive vision of a country home. Uh, it beckoned her, as she claimed, as a siren does a sailor um, a disguised as a clarion call. She was swept away, utterly overcome by her own heart's desire. So walking them over to their car, Mr. Kenyon extended a hand to Carolyn, um, holding hers gently. And she told her this, uh, he told her this is a wonderful place to raise a family. He delivered it with sincerity and convinced the young mother that her intuition was trustworthy. He then. And he 
burst into flames and disappeared. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he then left to head back to the farmhouse. Carolyn then reaches into her pur purse and retrieves a checkbook. She tells Mrs. Hertzog, my husband is out of town. How much would it take to hold this place? Then the realtor, she handed the realtor a check for $500. <laughs> Roger's going to be pissed. <laughs> yeah, that's the... Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. mm. Yeah, though she knew they didn't have the money, it was worth it to her risking Roger's wrath. The wrath of Roger. You know. When Carolyn returned home, she immediately went to Kathy and whisper screamed to her, I bought it. Kathy was shocked by this and uh, was honestly pretty nervous for the reaction <laughs> that Roger would give. Mm. When Roger returned, Carolyn explained that she what she had done, and Roger was not the bit pleased after... What? <laughs> mm -hmm. I know, shocking, right? And after an argument, Carolyn explained to him that she did this for all of them, which he seemed to understand. After a few moments, Mrs. Herzog, or a few months, Mrs. Herzog would tell Carolyn that she had been the only one to inquire about the listing. Mm -mm. She took this as a sign from the universe, and the next morning, everybody piled into the family car and they headed towards the farm. When they got there, Mr. Kenyon was working beside the barn, and he warmly welcomed his guests, even though no formal appointment had been made through the realtor. First off, who just shows up unannounced to right. some what? person's <laughs> house? But I, it, it's a different time, I guess. But regardless, um, and no appointment had been made through the realtor, and he knew it, but he knew exactly why they were there. Sure. So Mr. Kenyon focuses most of his attention on Roger. And as the children dispersed amongst the property, he told them to go and that no compass was required and no directions given or necessary. Weird. Mr. Kenyon's behavior through all, all of this. All roads lead back to the house. It literally. <laughs> <laughs> There's no escaping the house. It's like those movies when they're in the woods and they're like, I've seen that tree before. <laughs> It's <laughs> Don't you worry now. Go on out in the woods. You'll find your way. You'll find your way. The soul of a man's heart is sour. <laughs> Follow the gnomes. They'll lead you back. <laughs> but anyways. Ever been to Dudley Town? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was the creator yeah. of Dudley Town. But anyways, they could feel their way around by instinct is what he sold them. Creepy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so Mr. Kenyon took the couple around the property, showing them all the little spots. And Carolyn was trying to prove to Roger that it truly was paradise. Then Mr. Kenyon took the whole family down to the river. This was the pivotal point for Roger. After Roger stuck his feet in that river, he was sold. He could picture his family spending summers playing in this creek and all the memories they would make. Mr. Kenyon then took them inside the farmhouse where Roger started to walk, uh, to walk through the home looking for more important features like heating systems, plumbing, wiring, making mental notes of everything. Roger was trying to be um, indifferent and pragmatic. Now, Carolyn has been on the front lawn with the girls at this point and Mr. Kenyon having some refreshments while Roger did his walkthrough. And when Roger and Carolyn reconvened, she leaned into him and told him he wants us to have it. He'll do whatever it takes to make that happen. He needs to get out of the house. Literally. Yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah. You. Take my place in this <laughs> cursed spot. Literally. And that night, Carolyn and Roger had a deep discussion about the logistics of the home, like it only having one bathroom, which is concerning for us, um, <laughs> considering we're bringing a huge yes. amount of people. But they had a family of seven. Um, and they were also worried about what if your pipes froze and also the obvious um, issues of how are they affording the property? They stayed up all night discussing when finally Roger revealed that he had a private conversation with Mr. Kenyon. Um, he was basically going to allow them the time that they needed to require the, or acquire the money for the house. Oh. So he, you know, sometimes when a deal is too good, <laughs> right? Like seem things just seem to be falling way too easily into mm -hmm. place. And so the next morning, Carolyn and Roger would reveal to all the girls that they would be moving to this home. 
And the girls were all so excited. They had loved the property and they loved the idea of having a barn and cows and horses and all the farm life activity. But most importantly, Roger revealed that this would mean serious budgetary restraints. No more vacations. No more going out for ice cream. No more going out to dinner. Nothing. They would also have to sell the boat. Which eventually, if you read the book, it is a huge chunk of the book about the how brutal it was. He made all these girls help him completely renovate this oh, boat. Sure. Um, you know, making them scrape barnacles and right. stuff so that they could sell it. Um, and any money that they would get had to go into the fund for the house. The girls ended up for the entire summer making crafts and things to sell to the neighbors, including macrame pot holders and any money they made, they gave it to their parents for the home. And at one point, Nancy, one of the daughters would steal the veggie scraps from the kitchen and take it to women in paper bags and sell it to them for their compost piles, which Carolyn did not appreciate. By the way, Carolyn was like, you can't sell our trash to the neighbors. And Nancy's like, <laughs> They want it, so <laughs> I think she's a genius. That, yeah, that's repurposing. That's 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 resourcefulness. That's resourcefulness, absolutely. <laughs> so uh, we don't want to be the trash sellers, <laughs> exactly. But um, the kids all remained happy though throughout all of this because Kathy would step in and help keep the girls entertained and have fun during the summer while Roger was away working almost every single day of the week. Traveling salesman. Mm hmm. Uh, they then spent one last Christmas in Cumberland, and then in January of 1971, before you knew it, they had enough money, and they bought the house. Wow. Wow. So, that was pretty quick, too, in the scheme of things. No, but, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. But the parent family was moving into the home of their dreams, and eventually of their nightmares. Dun, dun, dun. And the rest, you will hear in the next episode. Boy. Right, you're right. We, we might need four. I told you. <laughs> Holy crap. It's sick. Yuck. But I know it's crazy. But yes. Um, so this even is a condensed version oh, absolutely. of everything that took place before this. Yeah. Um, so if you want to hear more details on this portion, I highly recommend reading Andrea Perrin's Read book. book. Yeah. Good book. It's good. It's dense. Um, there is a bit of fluff, but that's okay. Yeah. Um, her description of the property, I couldn't fit it into this episode, but it's literally like a whole chapter just describing this magical land where it felt like pixies were swirling around them and all sorts <laughs> of stuff. Well, it's interesting because, and they'll tell you this in positive ways too. It's like when uh, when you're on the, the right path, the resistance is less you know, you find yourself just moving towards it. Um, but that's true of any path that's being uh, cleared for you. Right. You know, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean the right path. It just means one where the obstacles have been pared down for some reason. And this definitely makes it feel like they were on a crash course with this property. You know, everything definitely seems like a, a setup, you know? It's like, it does. Yeah. yeah. All the way down to Mr. Kenyon just being bizarrely nice. Right. Like, yeah. Right. Just right. weird. Right. 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 Mm -hmm. right. right. <laughs> I don't trust this old man. He, it, well, it's also like, how did he survive in this house for so long? Or was he just getting so brutalized that he's like, he just oh. had to get rid of it. Yeah. He just had to get rid of it. Cause he even said that he hadn't lived there that all that long, yeah. you know? So that gives you an idea that he probably bought it with, with that same and yeah. same sensation of, well, look at this place. It's great. It's out. It's got a Creek. It's got 200 acres. This is amazing. Oh, demons <laughs> for sale. For I'll sale. work with you. <laughs> yeah. I mean, for him to give it to a family with like little girls, uh, and little, like just little kids, it must have been so bad that first off, no one wanted it. Like mm -hmm. no one came. Like this is probably the the only offer this house has gotten. It yeah, it makes me wonder offer. if the other well, yeah, was, if, if, if everyone around was like, "You're trying to sell that house? Are you crazy?" Yeah. <laughs> right. And so yeah, it was literally the only offer. Wow. And he was so like, that's it. It's, mm -hmm. he's like, I got to get out of here. It was some type of divine intervention, but yeah. like more malevolent um, than, you know, good entities. Yeah. I, I wonder if there is any, any record of, of him 
you know, of his experiences. Like right. If there's somewhere yeah. out there, you know, the diary of Mr. Kenman. Yeah, I mean, he was elderly, so, you know, he might have died before anything, oh, sure. any note of this. He but probably might be, is what he's saying. Well, but the point is he might have died with all those stories yeah. before. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm sure. He may know. not have. And that's just an interesting thing because yeah. living alone, elderly man on a farm, he probably didn't have anybody to talk to. Or, well, or we can ask the ghost one we're day or what happened. That's yeah. true. Well, yeah. tell us a story about Mr. Kenyon. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Kenyon, are you still here? Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah, well. You might have gotten away physically, but did you get away spiritially? You. The, I'll just leave y'all. No. <laughs> I'll just say, I'll leave y'all with this. He does say some very cryptic sort of things to the family um, when they first were moving in. Sure. And just a little teaser for you. He tells Roger, for the sake of your family, don't turn off the lights. Yes. Right. Big jokes. So you'll have to hear more about that in the next episode. Yikes. But yes, thank you guys for listening to today's episode. Um, please continue to listen throughout this series so that you are pre- well prepared for the Conjuring House experience. Um, and so it's going to be very fun. There's a lot of twists and turns to this story. So uh, we look forward to bringing those to you. Also, if you don't already follow us on social media, you can find us at Haunted City Podcast on all of the platforms. And if you have ghost mail that you would like to send to us, send it to ghostmail at hauntedcitypodcast.com. Uh, other than that, though, My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And stay spooky, y'all.